So welcome very to all of you to the Biodiversity Information Stand with Standards TADWIG 2020 virtual conference. So this is session contributed oral four and I'm your moderator. My name's Ellie Wallace and I'm greeting you from, uh, from Australia, from Melbourne in Australia, where it's um, the early evening. Uh, we're very grateful for technical support today from uh, Quentin Groom, who's in Belgium, and Paola Zamoglio, who's in Argentina. So you've got uh, very much a team from right around the world uh, coming to you today. This session is being recorded for later viewing, and um, we're going to record each speaker's talk separately. So we'll have a short pause in between talks while we stop and restart the recording. So thank you to all of you for joining us in this session. And thank you for the to the speakers for putting uh, up their papers and coming to present to us today. We've made the chat function available for technical questions or for conversing with other attendees. Um, but please uh, use the chat for the purpose that it's intended. And remember that when you signed up for the conference, you did agree to abide by the code of conduct and any inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat function being disabled. So for more information, you can see our code of conduct document. So during the session though, go ahead and ask questions in the chat while the speakers are presenting or captured, capture them in the shared document, which Quentin has shared and will probably share again. Uh, you'll find the link to the shared document in the chat. Please try to keep your microphones muted while our speakers are talking. Well, the arrangement will be that each speaker will talk for 10 minutes and then we'll have five to 10 minutes of question time before moving on to the next speaker. We'll have a general discussion time before the end of the session. And during that time, you're very welcome to unmute yourself and speak if you would like to. Please raise your hand using the participants list menu uh, and um, you'll see a little raise hand icon or type slash hand into the chat if you would like to speak. So without further ado, let's move to our first speaker. I'm very pleased to introduce um, Willem Kurtzer from the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, who's going to talk to us today about development of protocols and tools to manage the archive data from aquatic biodiversity surveys. So Willem, would you like to go ahead and please share your screen? Thank you, Ellie. Okay, well, I'll just dive right in. Um, with the temperature being in the high 30s today, that's exactly what I feel like doing, just diving right into the ocean. Um, but let me get to my talk, and that is to tell you about development of protocols and tools uh, to manage data from aquatic biodiversity surveys. And these are initial steps that we have taken. Um, so this is mainly a scoping exercise that we've done, although we have done some development of specific procedures and I will tell you about those. I just like to mention my collaborators because they are not displayed on the slide. These are Anthony Bernard, Taryn Murray, Elodie haynes veal Roxanne Juby and Wesley Phillip. The South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity, I'll just call that SIAB, that's the acronym, that's the institute where I work. We offer a number of research platforms for general use by the South African and international scientific community. And these are, for want of a better description, communal or shared platforms that people can use facilities and instruments. Um, and there are a number of projects that um, are funded by the Department of Science and Innovation and the National Research Foundation of which the Institute SIAB is a business unit. And some of these are on this slide. The African Coelacanth Ecosystem Program is a flagship program. Then we have the acoustic tracking array platform, which is a telemetry project where the movement and behavior of fish um, and other aquatic organisms are monitored. Um, the marine remote imagery platform, which is various kinds of um, images, underwater images, videos, and still images. And then various vessels, research vessels, boats, ships, and um, other instruments, a remotely operated vehicle, etc. These are just some nice pictures to show you what these look like. On the right, you can see stills from the baited remote underwater video or BRUV. I'll refer to that as BRUV um, throughout the talk. On the left, you can see a BRUV instrument. These are just some pictures to show you um, 
photos of the marine macro benthos, which were taken with the remotely operated vehicle. These were taken by LED Haynes Veal. We undertook a broad classification of the main biodiversity surveys undertaken by researchers at SIAB. And this is what we came up with. The most important categories were underwater photographic surveys, underwater acoustic telemetry surveys, and then specimen collecting or observations. I, I broadly lumped all specimen collecting, whether it was systematic or not, or observations into the same category. And so here I've just classified, um, I've just shown which taxonomic groups are targeted in these different surveys, uh, which kinds of equipment are used. And then importantly, I wanted to give an idea of the data output files and the multimedia files to make a distinction between the, the files, the kinds of files. File management is obviously very important. These files need to be preserved for posterity in the right formats. Um, they need to be linked to database records. And, and this is a, a big challenge that we're going to have to figure out. I'm going to talk only about the underwater photographic surveys for the rest of the talk, because as I say, these are initial steps and uh, we, we haven't yet gotten around to working out procedures for all the surveys. Uh, one of the main ideas is to reuse the specify software suite, the database schema and application, and to use this for data management and preservation and archiving. And the reason was that um, Specify has two very useful applications, but um, not only that, its database schema adequately represents biodiversity occurrences and sampling events, which are the two main classes of records that we need to represent. The two useful applications are the workbench, which one uses to migrate data into the database, and the schema mapper and data exporter, which work together that you use to publish standardized metadata. Then just to give you an idea of the data modeling, and as I say, this is limited only to the BRAV data, I decided to use the collecting trip table to represent samples. A sample is when the BRAV camera is dropped into the ocean and um, a video is recorded for an hour. That is then linked to these two kinds of records, which are a max n record, which is the maximum group size of a particular species within that video. So there can be many max n records, and these I call collecting events in the terminology of the specify schema. And then each group of fish can um, give rise to a number of lengths a length being of an individual, obviously, and that is represented by the collection object table in the specify schema. So that was all very neat and worked very well. And there you can see how I've decided to map the various fields in the BRAV data output file to the fields in the specify schema. Then I, I, I spoke about templates, so it's tools, protocols, and templates. And once again, the specify application gives us a workbench configuration file, which is a very useful kind of template to use in conjunction with a custom template that I created myself in just a, an Excel spreadsheet. The point is that when, when these are used together, we can ensure that there is consistency in the mapping of fields and migration of data to the specified database. And, and that is obviously a crucial aspect for data preservation. This is broadly the um, protocol or procedure or workflow that is followed to import data from the BRAV data output file into the specified database. We have a spreadsheet that we get from the instrument, the eMOBS file. That gets imported into a kind of a staging area in Microsoft Access where a semi-automated process of data cleaning is then followed. When that is complete, the, the data analyst creates a table, which is then exported to 
a spreadsheet or a text file, depending on which version of specify is being used. In the case of specify seven, which is the latest web application, it is a text file. And that is then validated in the specify workbench and uploaded to the specify seven database. So it all looks very simple at this high level, but uh, when the detail protocol is followed, there are obviously many steps in each of these uh, steps, many sub steps in each step. Um, I briefly mentioned the idea of needing to manage the files carefully. They, as you can imagine, there's a plethora of files that are generated not only by the marine imagery platform, but also by the other platforms. And these need to be managed very carefully to keep them current and, um, and organized and, as I say, linked to the database records. For the BRAV videos, these are obviously very large, and so this necessitated the use of a network attached storage for faster data access, easier administration, and simple configuration. And I'm not a systems administrator, that is where Wesley Phillip comes in, so I had to look that up, and I, I also gave you a little bit of a uh, justification for what I said there. Two minutes, um, Willem. Thank you. This is just to show you that there is a front end that is a very simple interface in Access that I developed just so that researchers could actually see their data and export it for their use or to send to colleagues. Um, otherwise, it would be pretty pointless. Um, and then just getting towards the end of the talk now, um, finishing up with publishing the data. And I found that this was a very easy process, as I said, using the Specify Schema Mapper and Data Exporter application. So we have actually um, published the BRAV data as well as the marine macrobenthos data. And uh, that looks quite good. You can find this by looking for the South African Institute for Aquatic Biodiversity on GBIF or uh, yeah, the specific data set. Uh, sorry, I can't actually see the name of that now, but uh, maybe I can put that in the, in the Google doc, sorry. And this is just to show you a few occurrences from that data set. There are the scientific names and um, a few metadata columns. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Willem. That's excellent. Um, and right on time as well. Um, I haven't seen any questions coming through in the chat. Um, Paula, have we got questions coming through in the notes? Not so far. Not so far. So, Willem, I know to, I'll ask a question then. Um, uh, in, in the abstract that uh, you talked a little bit about um, absence data, and um, uh, I know that um, uh, ecologists everywhere are very interested in absence data. Uh, and there's some techniques that you get that, that you can use to get absence data for um, for terrestrial studies. I was just wondering how how do you go about um, gathering absence data for marine studies? Uh, that's very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I, I I don't know if I can answer your question absolutely precisely, but it has emerged as one of the important um, steps in the process of managing the data and that is to get feedback from the data originator. Because of course, um, one can't really be sure that the, the record is truly absent or merely missing and needs mm. to be found, I think. Um, this is just my view as a data manager. And so what I plan to do is to actually enforce a feedback stage in the data management process where the, the data originator himself or herself actually confirms that data are absences. Mm. Uh, you know, data are absent rather than missing. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, a few other important points. Uh, I've just got a few written down here. It's important in this project to um, accommodate other potential institutes that need to collaborate in data management. Um, I've mentioned the file management. Um, then there's different granularity. Some platforms will generate images that we merely need to document. 
and the detailed biodiversity data will be scored or marked up at a later stage by different people. Sampling events and the unique identifiers associated with those generated centrally. Okay, well, um, last opportunity, last chance to add some, to ask a question of Willem or keep thinking and we will um, come back to, might have an opportunity to come back to questions um, later in the session. So thank you very much, Willem. That was a really um, um, thank you. terrific and very nice to see some underwater bio biology. <laughs>